Well, welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County's program about China's crimes against humanity. My name is Thorin Tritter. I am the museum and programming director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Tonight's program builds on a program we held about a year ago when we joined with the Nassau County Office of Asian American Affairs and several other organizations to hold an informational talk about what was taking place in China. Sadly, even as more and more stories have drawn attention to the current genocide that's taking place, the situation continues. Tonight, we're honored to have with us a Uyghur survivor who, through a translator, will describe her own firsthand experience in China's internment camp system. But before we get to our program, I want to recognize our co-sponsors, the Campaign for Uyghurs and the Sisterhood of Salam, Sh Salam Shalom. And here, let me ask Lisa Kaplan, uh, sorry, Lisa Kaplan Miller, the New York Metro Coordinator of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, to say a few words about her work on behalf of the Uyghur people. Lisa, could I get you? There you go. Okay, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Thorin. I'm happy to be here. Uh, just to tell everyone a little briefly about the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom and our work in support of the Uyghurs. Uh, we are an organization that brings together Jewish and Muslim women. The goal is to get to know each other, to build bridges, to connect, to see all the things that we have in common, and to together fight anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Um, it is a unique need that our, that our faiths have. Um, we have 160 chapters across the country. Um, I am the regional coordinator for the New York metro area, and we have nine chapters locally, Manhattan, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. Um, we also have teen chapters. One of the things I wanted to share with you that I think connects so beautifully today is one of the things we have done is had up until the pandemic had yearly trips. And in 2019, we took a joint trip, 50 Muslim and Jewish sisters to Germany and Poland, and we visited Auschwitz. Um, one of the most powerful moments was we had a, a, a several moments of joint prayer there that I will never, never, never forget. Um, and it was a moment of solidarity. Also, our trip was led by Manaza Fridi, who's a Muslim scholar, and she is director of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College. Um, it was very powerful. So we are geared, our, our, one of the main purposes of organization besides the one-to-one -one relationship building is to take social action. Um, and for that reason, we have a number of social action groups, including the Uyghur and India Action Group, um, our racial justice action group. Um, we have an Israel-Palestine task force. That's a big issue these days right now for us. Um, and we have had a big commitment though over these last two years to the Uyghurs. And Lena is a member of our committee that's been working on this issue. Um, and we are very committed to educating our members and our communities and taking action. Lena is gonna tell you later about many action steps that you can take. Um, and she'll tell you a little bit about the toolkit that we've put together so that anyone can take this, bring it to their community groups, take it to their organizations as individuals and educate people and take steps. So we are honored to be here and thank you so much, Lauren, for uh, including us. Thanks very much, Lisa. I really appreciate all your help along the way in planning this. And uh, I'm glad to, to have more people learn about what you guys are doing because it's important work. Thank you. Um, Again, I'm very grateful for the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom and for the Campaign for Uyghurs for helping to organize and publicize our program this evening. Okay, so to get our program started, I'm pleased to introduce Lena Lemberg, who has been, uh, has been an educator for more than 20 years and has focused much of her recent scholarship on the human rights abuses of the Uyghurs in China. Lena is a steering committee member and uh, and North, for the Northern California Regional Representative, sorry, and the Northern California Regional Representative for Human Rights Educators USA, and is a managing editor for the International Journal of Human Rights Education at the University of San Francisco, where she is currently pursuing her doctoral degree with her dissertation on the genocide being waged against Uyghurs in China. Lena is going to give us some of the broader background and let us know about what has been taking place in China over the last several years. Lena, can I pass it over to you? Thank you so much for joining us. 
thank you very much, Thorin, and thank you all for being here. Um, you know, and thank you to the Sisterhood and Campaign for Uyghurs for making this program possible, and of course the Holocaust Memorial Center. So what I'm going to do is share my screen, and I have some slides, and I'll talk a little bit about the background of the situation with the Uyghurs and sort of a history of discrimination, and then I'll move into the present day. Um, crisis, which constitutes crimes against humanity, including genocide. And then I'll talk about what makes it genocide. And then um, if anyone has questions, I will be available at the end for questions. So let me share my screen here. And I'm going to get started here. So um, I think it's important to understand a little bit about who the Uyghurs are, in addition to talking about the current crisis and, of course, the immense tragedy that they as a people are having to deal with right now. I think, you know, there's so much more to them than uh, victims of the situation. So um, Uyghurs live, the majority of Uyghurs live in China, in the northwesternmost province of China, which is called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which by most Uyghurs is called East Turkestan. And so just geographically, you can see Xinjiang is in the north western part of China. Um, and it's home to about 11 million Uyghurs, though these numbers I've seen uh, ranging um, up and down, but around 11 to 12 million Uyghurs. And the land in Xinjiang is the Uyghurs indigenous homeland. And they are thought to have settled there in the sixth century CE. And they're one of China's 56 officially recognized ethnic groups. And the majority of people in China are Han Chinese, which make up over 90% of the population. Um, and Uyghurs are Muslim. They speak a Turkic language, which uses an Arabic derived writing system script, which you can see in the picture in the bottom left there. And their traditions are really different from traditional or modern Han Chinese. And uh, they're known for their music, their dancing, poetry, calligraphy, and delicious food, um, and lots of art. So uh, I'm gonna give you again a bit of a history about the situation. So in the 1950s, the Communist Party began to take control of Shuar, of Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region, or East Turkestan. And in 1956, there were policies that created intolerance and repression of ethnic cultures other than Han. And in the late 60s, there were numerous armed conflicts in Xinjiang as part of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and I'm not going to get into that history now, but that is a significant piece. And then after Mao died in 1976, gradual change began to take place um, all over China, but specifically in Xinjiang. And in the 80s, things were relatively peaceful. But in the 90s, the Chinese government began to develop Xinjiang. So you can see in the picture, um, you know, these new developments, these high rise apartment buildings, shopping centers and things that you'll see in a few minutes, these were all starting to be developed in the 90s. And um, it's significant to note that Xinjiang province contains a wealth of natural resources, which include coal, oil, natural gas, minerals, and cotton. And the government encouraged people from other parts of China to migrate into Xinjiang for work. And the vast majority of these people were Han Chinese. So these changes, the development that I mentioned a minute ago, the changes um, in urban planning ended up demolishing old housing and building new apartment blocks, created new shopping centers, uh, formerly public spaces were commercialized into private spaces, and all of these new developments were intended for the Han, for the Han who were migrating into uh, East Turkestan or Shuar for work. And so as a result of this, the Han and Uyghur communities became increasingly segregated. And I want to um, note a couple of specific events that um, have led or contributed to, I think, what's happening today. So in 1997, um, in the city of Gulja or Yining, if any of you know the Mandarin, um, there was a peaceful protest and protest by Uyghurs. So Uyghurs in Gulja um, gathered for a peaceful protest. They were starting to protest the um, lack of opportunities. They wanted you know, access to jobs. They were educated and they wanted to participate in society and they um, were being discriminated against and all the opportunities or the majority were going to the Han. So they gathered for a peaceful protest and many of the protesters were arrested and their relatives protested their arrests and riots ensued between the protesters and the police. And it was around this time that the Uyghurs started to be commonly called religious extremists and terrorists. And then in 2009, there was a really significant kind of larger scale event called the Urmqi uprising, which sometimes is actually 
actually called the Urumqi Massacre. And this was in 2009, again, in the main square in Urumqi, Uyghurs Uyghur gathered for a peaceful protest, and it was similar issues, you know, lack of opportunities. Um, and we just looked at the development, increasing segregation that was happening. So they gathered for a peaceful protest, police tried to disperse them. Um, the protesters ended up migrating through the city and violence ensued between protesters and police. Uh, Han civilians got involved and there were deaths on both sides. And following these Urumqi riots or the Urumqi uprising or Urumqi massacres, it's sometimes called, hundreds of Uyghur men and teenage boys were detained. And so they, you know, they were forcibly detained. They were um, disappeared actually. And families could not get any information about where they were. And if they asked, they were threatened that, you know, more of their children would be taken. So um, these enforced disappearances continue today en masse in what China is calling re-education camps. Um, so, you know, here's just an image. You can see the Uyghurs in distress clearly here. Um, so I'm going to fast forward to more present day information. So in 2017, news began to emerge about the mass internment of Uyghurs in what China continues to call re-education camps. And these facilities have since uh, been called concentration camps. And it's estimated that between one in three million people, one in three million people have been interned in these camps. And what I've heard from some of my Uyghur um, community members and friends is that the sentiment is that if you are lucky, you'll come out. But if you're not lucky, no one cares. And um, so again, this is something that I feel we can take as a call to action, you know, we to show that we do care. Um, so in 2019, the New York Times published a set of leaked Chinese government documents. And these documents, it was like a set of over 400 pages of documents. And these documents confirmed the deliberate, intentional plan to detain Uyghurs and other Muslims in these camps. And none of the detainees have been officially charged. And reasons can range from um, a government official finding something on a Uyghur's phone, uh, showing that they had contact with a person in Turkey, um, or even having a Quran or other religious materials in the house, um, you know, things that are not crimes. And so these Uyghurs, the millions of Uyghurs who've been detained have not been charged with anything officially. So I'm going to talk a bit about the camps and I just want to warn people, you know, some of this is um, maybe difficult to hear. And I think it's also important for us to acknowledge what's going on. So um, it, the conditions in the camps by all accounts are just horrendous, the living conditions. And then in the camps, Uyghurs have been forced to eat pork, drink alcohol, which I'm sure we all recognize goes against, you know, Islam in, in most cases. Um, and then I'm gonna just go over briefly some of the atrocities that have been reported from the camp. So torture, uh, both men and women, various ages, um, numerous accounts of torture exist. Sexual assault also, both men and women, but I think uh, the vast majority of women um, have been subjected to sexual assault. There's organ harvesting that's been um, going on in China actually has a really well-documented history of using prisoners as organ donors, the Falun Gong um, that was happening some time ago. And so it's thought that we have been used as um, sources of organs. And of course, uh, maybe it's not surprising to hear that many attempts at suicide have been reported given uh, everything that's going on. And then I think it's really important for us to recognize that in 2018, crematoria, uh, it was reported that crematoria were rapidly being constructed throughout um, Shuar. And you know, I think we know the last time we saw crematoria being built next to camps on a large scale. So this is clearly very disturbing, but it also uh, violates Uyghur funerary traditions. So it's sort of like a double um, atrocity. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about how um, Uyghur culture and long-term patterns uh, relate to genocide. And so we'll get into that in a second. So I think it's a really important to note, and I know we'll hear more from Trus and I about this, um, but women have had to deal with a whole host of issues both in and outside of the camps. And these include, as I just mentioned, sexual assault. There's also um, forced abortions, imposed birth control and sterilization. And so not only of course are these affronts and violations to the women themselves, but it's significant when we talk about 
genocide um, and what constitutes genocide. And so looking at these um, forced methods of birth control upon women on a large scale affects the Uyghur population and culture, cultural transmission as a whole. And so I'll come back to that in a little bit. And so I wanna talk about a little bit more about um, how Uyghur culture and identity are also being systematically um, destroyed throughout China as a whole, but especially in Shuar. So in 2017, China imposed a ban on growing what they called abnormal beards, um, as well as a ban on wearing veils and burqas throughout Shuar, throughout Xinjiang. And we know that since 2016, mosques, shrines, and cemeteries have been desecrated and destroyed throughout Shuar. Even farther back to 2015, uh, we know that there was a ban issued on children's names that were associated with, quote, extremism. And then in 2017, there was an additional list of banned names. And these names include, you know, Fatima, Aisha, Mohammed, names that obviously are associated with Islam. So um, that same legislation that I just mentioned that banned beards and veils also outlawed homeschooling. And this demanded that children receive a national state education. And in 2017, reports began emerging of children being placed in state care after both parents were detained in these camps that we have talked about. And it's um, really important to recognize that these state care facilities, which include orphanages, shelters, boarding schools, they are not what we might imagine here to be an orphanage or a boarding school. They're all highly secured compounds with armed guards, armed police, barred windows, barbed wire fences. People are not allowed to come and go. So this separation of children and specifically placing them in boarding schools, we've seen this elsewhere, you know, including in the United States with our own indigenous peoples. So um, another thing which has gotten quite a lot of press is the issue of uh, forced labor. So we know that Uyghurs have been placed in these factories with boarding facilities since 2017. And so it, by by all accounts, these factories are not much different from the camps themselves in that they're constantly, people are constantly surveilled. They're not allowed to have any sort of religious expression or freedom, practice any traditions. There's, um, you know, indoctrination by the Chinese Communist Party at all hours outside of work hours. Um, and many Uyghurs we know have been transferred from the camps in Xinjiang to uh, elsewhere in China. So there are forced labor factories in Xinjiang, but also outside of China. And so if you look at the, the little map on the right, you know, the bluish area is Xinjiang, and these arrows point to all sorts of places in the far east part of China where Uyghurs have been forcibly moved to these factories. And so this also separates them from their families, in addition to, you know, having to be under these surveilled conditions and, and engage in forced or enslaved labor. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, there are, you know, lots of ideas about why this is happening. I'm just gonna quickly mention a few of them. So uh, the main thing that China has used to rationalize and justify this campaign of repression is that uh, Uyghurs have been poised <laughs> as terrorists. And so there have been these allegations of terrorism. Um, and, and so I mentioned, you know, even back in 1997, this talk of calling Uyghurs terrorists and extremists started, and this has kind of continued. And right after 9-11, um, you know, where our country declared the global war on terror, China uh, approached the US and the UN and um, ended up getting a Uyghur organization called um, the East Turkestan Islamic Movement or the East Turkestan Independence Movement. It uh, became designated as a terrorist organization. So it was put on the list of, you know, international terrorist organizations and China used that designation to wage this uh, lar or large part of this campaign that they continue to say um, they're doing in order to combat terrorism. And it's really important to note that that organization on November 5th of last year was taken off of the terrorist list. So it is no longer considered a terrorist organization, yet China continues to use that as the rationale for what they're doing. And then another piece of the rationale is that um, Uyghurs pose a supposed threat to national unity because Uyghurs have, uh, there have been a couple of movements to separate from China to become independent. And so China, again, frames that as a threat to their national unity. 
And I think another major thing that it's really important for us to ask ourselves, I think, is um, how does global Islamophobia feed into what's going on? You know, I wonder if Uyghurs were not Muslim, if the international response would be different. I also wonder if Uyghurs weren't Muslim, if the organization would have been put on the terror list in the first place. So I really think that global Islamophobia is a contributing factor also. And, um, you know, the, the terrorism narrative feeds into the, all these stereotypes about bad Muslims. So I think it's important to recognize that. And then finally, the Belt and Road Initiative is a huge development plan that China has been working on for some years now, and it relies on Xinjiang as major um, centers in order to connect to much of the rest of the world to the West. And so if you look at the little picture on the right, Urumqi and Kashgar are both major cities in Xinjiang. And you can see that the Belt and Road Initiative cuts right through there. And also we've already mentioned that um, Xinjiang is very rich in natural resources. So, um, you know, it doesn't seem coincidental that this is the region that China is highly developing and that um, Uyghurs seem to be uh, not included in the development of their own indigenous homeland. So I want to move to what is genocide. And when I talk about genocide, there are different definitions of genocide. When I talk about genocide, I'm talking about the international definition that much of the world accepts that was adopted in 1948 by the UN actually after the Holocaust with the intention of never allowing this uh, you know, horrific crime against humanity to happen again. And I think a lot of people have a sort of misconception that genocide simply means the mass killing of a group, but it's actually um, a little more complicated than that. And as a whole, the idea of genocide is that um, there are things that are committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And so the actual official UN definition, the Genocide Convention lists these bullet points as possible criteria for genocide. And I would just like to point out that China right now is what's happening to the Uyghurs and what China is doing meets all of these criteria. So there are definitely members of the group who have been killed. Um, certainly there has been serious bodily and mental harm to members of the group. Uh, deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part. We've seen this. Also imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. We talked about that. Um, and then lastly, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So all of these points right now are being met in what China is doing. And so that's why I and many other people are calling it genocide. So what's being done? So I'm going to briefly talk about what's being done. And then at the end, we can talk about what any of us can do. You know, what can a regular person do about this? So we'll get to that toward the end of our evening. But I just want to quickly list. So what's being done? So actually in 2020, there was a bill that is called the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act that passed. And this basically imposes sanctions on people who are connected with what's going on in Shuar, uh, you know, related to the genocide. And then right now, there are a couple of things that are being considered in Congress. And one is the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And it, again, um, you know, this obviously it strives to prevent the forced labor, the enslaved labor that we were just talking about that's happening and uh, through sanctions and other things. And then there's a pretty new one that was just introduced in March, which is called the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act. And this uh, would designate people from the Uyghurs from Shuar as um, special humanitarian concern refugees, which would streamline their refugee process. Um, and then finally, people are starting all over the world to talk about genocide. So our government declared genocide in, you know, early this year, and then Canada and the Dutch parliament in the next month in February 21, and then Britain recently has been um, using the term genocide, and they just hosted a, a tribunal last week, which uh, really also laid bare a lot of the things that are happening. And then very recently, um, Lithuania last month declared genocide, and then just uh, last week, I think, the Czech Republic and Belgium also declared genocide. And they're calling out China's crimes against humanity and using the term genocide, which is really important. And then, um, of course, there's advocacy being done by Uyghur activists and organizations. And you're going to hear from somebody in just a moment. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, and then I will see you again toward the end of the program where we can talk about ways in which we can engage in this issue. Thank you so much. 
Lena, that was super, I mean, a bit of a whirlwind, but I know we're under the gun with time pressure and, and but uh, you've given us a lot as a background there that I think is super helpful. Uh, so thank you very much. And as you said, we'll get you back to give us some guidance on things we can actually do, concrete things we can all do uh, in, a, in a little bit. Thanks. Um, so at this point, um, with that helpful overview and background, I'd like to turn it over to Tersenai Ziyawuddin, a Uyghur survivor of China's internment camps and her interpreter. Um, and as I'm sure you know, the act of listening to testimony is an important and privileged one. And we understand that by hearing from a witness, we too become witnesses and we become not only entrusted with understanding the events taking place in China, but empowered to respond to the intolerance and hate currently underway. And I should always, I, I wanna mention, that this is something I always talk about when we're meeting with a survivor of any kind, that I say this is, to hear testimony, this can be painful for the survivor, painful for them to share their testimony. It can also be difficult for audiences to hear. And so I would just urge you all to be gentle with the presenters, gentle with yourself and gentle with the rest of the audience present with us this evening. Um, Tersina Ziawuddin, in, interpreter, her interpreter is gonna read a statement written by Ms. Ziawuddin that's uh, gonna be about 15 minutes or so. And then we'll open the floor to Q&A and the interpreter is gonna um, pose questions to Ms. Ziawuddin and we'll get them both to uh, respond to your questions and also have Lena come back. So we'll get that going. Um, if you have questions while the presentation's going on, I just ask you type them into the Q&A feature of Zoom and we'll make sure to have time to get to them. Okay, so can I get you guys both to come back on? There we go. So I pass it over to you, uh, Arzu, and I leave it to you to start. Олар туган мушу ташкалатлага хэммаңлага көптүн көп рахмат идим. Биздин вэтнам Шарк Туркстандаки аш сулум татып аткан инсанларны ахузарын алмаш үчүн урындаштырган биздин бу авазы бүтүн дүнияга аңтыш үчүн мыштактыр фурсат бергенинг үчүн хэммаңлага рахмат идим. Менин исмим Турсмай Зайнабын. Вэтнам Шарк Туркстандан күнэс наястым болум. Мен бешимден өткен хәм көйген ишланы мә ишкеттім қытайна жазаларға дейді шыққан шайыт болым әм. Бұ бешимден өткен көйген вақадан сүзләй үшін сіләге үземінің ауазым еткіз үшін тұным еңгіз тұлым болмағалық үшін арзу ғанымның сіләге тәржім құп берішін үміт құлым әм. Рәхмет. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Tursana Ziaudun. I want to extend my heartful thank you to all the people who have taken time to attend this event. Also, I want to um, say many thanks to the organizer of this event who is helping us uh, to give voice to the um, voiceless uh, Uyghur Muslims in East Turkestan. And um, I, I, I'm from the uh, Kines County, uh, city from East Turkestan, and I had experience. You know, I be, I be, I had experience twice um, locked up in the concentration camps that's being operated by CCP in East Turkestan because I don't uh, speak in English very well, uh, so I have to ask my translator to read my statement for you. So here I'm going to read uh, her statement on the behalf of Tursanay. I'm an Uyghur from the indigenous people of Turkestan. Because my husband is a Kazakh, I went to Kazakhstan with my husband in 2011 and lived in Kazakhstan from 2011 to 2016. However, 
because I didn't have a resident visa, I had to return to China in 2016. Upon my return, a series of events began that culminated in what has become one of the most nightmarish experiences of my life. Eventually, I was detained by the police in April of 2017, but prior to my detainment, I was subject to many stops and searches. When I was detained, I was taken by the police on the streets to the concentration camp. During this period, I spent one month inside of the camp. It is challenging to describe now with words the terrors that I felt there. There, we were forced to give up our faith. Every day, we were forced to praise the Chinese Communist Party and say, there's no such a thing as Allah. The chief who was in charge there was a Han Chinese, and we were forced to eat haram food. Haram food means the forbidden food for Muslims. The food in concentration camp was terrible. As a result, I suffered from the spells of poor health that culminated in bouts of the unconsciousness. Following this, I was temporarily released due to the medical reasons, even though I was still monitored by the police. During that time, the police had begun the practice of seizing passports of Uyghur people, and thus mine was seized as, as well. Then I was detained for the second time in March 2018. Compared to my first detainment, it appeared that things had dramatically worsened. There were around 1,000 people in the first camp that I used to live in, but in the second camp, there were around 4,000 to 5,000 of people. I saw four buses containing new detainees coming in each day. The experience of my time in the camp, especially my second period there, is burned into my mind forever. There, I was subject to almost constant abuse. They brutally took off, my, took off our clothes and removed our jewelry. It was removed with such a force that my ear began bleeding. One image haunts me more than others of an elder woman I saw when entering the camp. Her clothes and headscarf were removed by force and she was sobbing. She appeared to be in her 70s, an elder woman of our community. Being subject to such cruelty, each time I think of it, it brings such sadness and rage into my heart. During my second stay in the camp, hunger was um, such, a great, uh, such a great threat. Sometimes they offered us food, sometimes they didn't. It seems that they had no regard for our health or the health of those elderly among us who needed to eat. There was no bathroom in the room where we kept, and instead we were forced to utilize buckets and other unsanitary means. Often they wouldn't clean the pot until the following day, and we would be forced to seat visit for the entire night. Our, our long hair was lopped off and we were forced to watch endless hours of state propaganda on television. They physically and mentally tortured us. When we were allowed to use bathrooms in the, in the day, we were limited to just two minutes per person. Any more time than this, and we were beaten. We were often taken to an interrogation room and forced to confess to crimes that we didn't commit. Otherwise, they physically tortured us. After three months, they started to take the woman in the middle of night 
when they came back, they behaved very differently. Here, they means uh, the woman, okay? Those women who were taken in the middle of night wouldn't speak to anyone. Some of them even lost their minds here, becoming shells of their former selves. One day, I was taken in the middle of the night. I thought this was another interrogation like there had been before, but instead, I was sexually abused and I was raped. I was even sexually tortured using some instruments. I can't describe how painful it was. They had an electric stick and I didn't know what it was. And it was pushed inside my genital tract, torturing me with an electric shock. This night, more than any other, has been seared into my memory. My stomach hurt after that night. I was taken to the hospital for the medical examination, but I didn't receive any medical treatment. I saw women lose their minds or die in the camp, but none of us received proper medical treatment. Because my husband kept fighting for my release, at the end of 2018, I was released, but I was completely destroyed after release. I needed to receive medical treatment. I noticed the life outside the camp became so different. There's fear in every Uyghur's face. Uyghurs we are forced to eat pork and drink alcohol. This is the situation in Turkestan. Chinese government keeps showing how happily the Uyghurs are living right now. But I know it's not true. Chinese government said all the detainees we are released, but only a few people that we are willing to give up their religion and do whatever they we are asking for, we are being released. Most of the people are still suffering in the concentration camps. I know that all, all of us are inside our hearts, a common humanity. So I plead with you to hear the cry of the Uyghur people. We are being destroyed as we speak, men and women and child. I know the international community has, has it within their power to demand an, an, demand an end to the atrocity. And I beg that they should do it quickly. For the millions of Uyghurs, we are not able to yet walk out of those camps who are still suffering in darkness. And I share my story so that perhaps they will be able to tell theirs one day sooner. Thank you. Thank you for reading that statement and for sharing Tersenet's story. Oh, I, wanna, I wanna encourage people if they have questions to, to pose them using the Q&A feature of Zoom and, and we'll pose them here. And I see some people have already raised some questions. So let me let me forward those or, or restate those to you. Uh, one person writes uh, or asks about how does Terse and I feel about the fact that the American social media and other big businesses um, are, not, are, are, are not shutting down criticism of the Chinese government or are shutting down criticism of the Chinese government because they're looking to benefit monetarily from China. So how, how does Terse and I feel about what she sees going on in America and the response of American companies? Um, Tursanay, 
ولان مشو از نگیشو خطاید کلدگان پایده من پایت نکوزل ب، اونها تنگ تمایت کنی سوزل سوزل مات کنی دکارت اساس کند قرائسیس. هر آدم نان آذر اند، اونها بز آذر یش کنده نسیه. اما من حقیق بر جلو که انسان قشته قبلا آدم بوسا چکم شوند قلدو. اند پایده من پایتی کن نسیه او هم مدام که کیرک نیست، شوند خوان و چون بلکه خود از میمات کند، حقیقا وجدان بلند اویلا پاکسا بو انسان که یعن بو بر فقط بر اویورنال امس اویاد بیان خزخلام با یعنی خرخزلام با باش کمال نسل زاد مسلمان حتی عدد بر کتکن لبر دنگ نمیکن اشلان چتاقت خواهد بود خان داخل بود اشتاق خواهد کرد من بندق زدم نی مثلا پتن از شهر دو پنج هم پتن انسان ل دن انگلابات هم ببرد من امس بندق ان کنچ ل مشنش ل گپ ل نم انگلاب ترک یا نشونم یا نکوزم خرابات هم بوده او بر انسان جور کد بر انسان و اشتغالش بوده انسان بس اون دکمه ای دپویلیم اولان اما حقیقا ویدان بلا اویل بودنگا چکم اکنون آمریکا حکومت نام از هزار من شنیدی اویورلان با اشک کمال بلو بات کند با شرکت لانم ما چکم آمریکا یا شاید گان مش آمریکا دن پخش بوده انسان پرورش و فتاین دن چکم خود ازش نمیت کنم من. I believe anyone who has a little bit humanity in his heart should speak up against this atrocity that's happening inside of China right now. Um, money, of course, money and interest, this can be important, but humanity is more important than that. Um, but what I have been uh, telling you is not about only my personal experience. It is, a, it is the same situation for the all Uyghurs and Kazakhs, for um, Kazakhs who are living there. This is not a, a small thing. It's a, such a big atrocity uh, that even now U.S. government started to um, started to mentioning it and condemning it and they start to take an action and i want um, i want other business sectors also uh, in support and will uh, support us uh, thank you uh, somebody else is just asking for a little more clarification about what or a little more explanation about what Tristan and i went through and how she came to the united states and uh, it's only uh, um, excuse me, can I, can you please make it clear? So she just wants to know how Tursunai came to U.S., right? Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Tursunai, uh, I'm going to ask you a question about America. I'm going to ask you a question about the time of Kazakhstan. I'm going to ask you a question about the time of Kazakhstan. شونو دیگه خیلی طور دوام بودی من اول ویز بهم دید ترس و یه ترس که ممکن است بهم دی یه چیم کازاکستان گرچه دانه بودم اول گرچه دانه بهم دی من ویا ترس ممکن است دیگه بهم دیش نه عمل نیوم من آمریکا کنسل ها کرد از من معلم کردم من خیلی یه نخته دوست خیستم چون من اونجا دا ویا دا اونو دم یه گرکل کت شد تو اون بلدی من خوختم چون من کت می می کتیش با ما دو ماند دیدم من آمریکا کنسل بلد کردم اول من خورد دی شو در اقدام من قطع آغرب کردم، او لعنت چکت من تن سلامت کنم بوم میکنم. شو ترکیه کردیم، ویزاش ترپ من آش دوام نشدم. من قازاقستان فقط خودم زنگ هم خطر باد ویاده. چوکم دکتر خلادم قصد اول ترپ کنم که فرقیم قصد بوده ویادی آن. ویادم اوه اول رمز من اوت قوید من تیش مزدم با آش یولشیم شک مزد با اوی مزد آش اشتیگ قم ب تیش دم نم کیت دیارم کیت کیت اوت قوید باشته خطر لب بوده. شو من ترکیه گشت تا کلیپ اشاره دوالت نشتریان دا می نام بگ اگر کم یکر نشک کتی چه آمریکا دولتی بودن دو خبر کتی آمریکا کنسل ورد کلا هم دو خبر کتی می نام ویزام نه یک پدی آمریکا کیپ دوالت نشک کردی یک بودم میشه کلم شنوند من من سخت لامت آمریکا یک تک کلم من میشه از این یه شوالت مشتاق کلم دا اکتیلی تو سنی کیم تو قزاقستان ویز سری مانس از ویزام um, uh, and then after after three months, the Kazakhstan didn't want to uh, extend her visa, and uh, she had um, this uh, risk that she could be uh, deported to deported back to China. You know, uh, you know, for all Uyghurs, deporting back to China means like death penalty. So she she felt uh, herself um, unsafe, 
and also there was um, uh, an incident uh, that the, the fire, the, there was a fire in her um, house, and uh, so she felt the danger. So she went to a U.S. consul a consulate uh, and told them, uh, ask, ask their, ask an asylum from them, um, because it was too dangerous to wait in Kazakhstan. She came to Turkey first, um, and later she got a visa to the for coming to uh, U.S. After came, came after coming to U.S., then she managed to go to the hospital and get some treatment. And she also she had, she suffered a lot of health conditions while um, when she was in Kazakhstan. So she had to come to Turkey first to get some treatment as before coming to before before coming to U.S. Thank you. It, you mentioned, or, or Tars and I mentioned, that she uh, had originally gone to Kazakhstan because of her husband's work. Was that right? Um. Because um, she came to Kazakhstan first because her husband had um, Kazakhstan citizenship. My, my question was really what happened to her, her husband and what's happened, where is he now and was he able to get out? And Susan Susan Yolchan Kazakhstan her husband is still living in Almuta, Kazakhstan, um, because her um, house was burned down. Um, her husband is living with her with his uh, sister um, in Kazakhstan currently, and he he has not able to come right now because. Um, after Tursanai gets her permission to live in the U.S., then uh, he might be able to come to U.S. And, and somebody's also asking for clarification. Or from, did Tursanai live in China before? Is that where she's from originally? And then she moved to Kazakhstan and then returned to China? Or where was she bef before? Did she live in China originally? And Tursanai is in the and Kazakhstan Akinma <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Uh, Tursunay and her husband, we are born in um, Kunes County of Volja city in Eastern So they, you, you know, 
so they 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 grew up um, there and uh, after um, after she get married to a Kazakh person and the um, her husband uh, got uh, his citizenship from Kazakhstan um, but she couldn't get a citizenship because she's Uyghur and he's Kazakh. Okay. You know, I think most of the questions that we have seen are really about what we can do, what we can do to help. And for that, if I may, I'd like to bring Lena Lenberg back onto the screen and get her to give us some pointers. And then maybe there'll be some final questions about things that we can do. But mm -hmm. I, I've seen a lot of questions about this. So I want to, I really want to convey my gratitude to Terse and I for, for sharing her story because it's a, it's a powerful story and a difficult one to hear, let alone to understand what she's gone through. But I, I know that everybody's interested in finding out what can we do. So can I pass it over to Lena for now and get her to give us some take on that? Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I'm so happy that people want to know what you can do. And you know, I think one of the things you can do that everybody can do is talk to people about what's going on, you know, just raising awareness um, and using the term genocide for people to understand really the significance of these crimes against humanity. So number one, talk to people, inform people. I think this is one of the most under uh, reported human rights issues of all time. And so I think, you know, just spreading the word is something everybody can do. Um, but if you would like to take more kind of substantial organized action, I have some links that um, maybe Thorne, if you could share with people in the chat. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are a couple of bills right now being considered in Congress. One is for the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which advocates, you know, to stop the forced or enslaved labor um, by passing sanctions. So there's a link where you can go care. The Council for Arab Islamic Relations has put together already like a form where all you need to do is fill out your information and then they automatically forward it to your local Congress people. So if you want to fill out your information to support the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, that's one thing that you can do. It only takes maybe a minute. Um, and then another thing is the other bill that I mentioned, the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act, which would give um, Uyghurs from East Turkestan special refugee status, refugees of special humanitarian concern, which would make it easier for them to come to the U.S. as refugees. So there's also a link, uh, maybe Thorne, that you can share for that. And so it's similar to the uh, we the Uyghur Human Rights, uh, I'm sorry, the Forced Labor Prevention Act, where it's just a form that you fill out with your information, and they have it set up such that it automatically is forwarded to your local Congress people. So those are two things in Congress. So those can you know you can support laws that support Uyghurs by signing on to both of those. Um, and then there are a number of petitions circulating around. So another issue that we haven't really talked about, but that you may see in the news is that China is slated to hold the Olympics, host the Olympics in 2022. Um, and so a lot of people are voicing concern about that. You know, why should China be allowed to host the Olympics, which have sort of an international spirit of camaraderie when this is happening. So there's another link that if you are interested, um, you can sign a petition that advocates against China hosting the Olympics in 2022. And I know, you know, I'm based in California, so I'm not sure where everybody is here on the call, but um, locally, you know, in your local regions, there are likely some weaker actions that you can participate in, such as protests. Um, July 5th is a big anniversary for Uyghurs, as I mentioned that Urumqi uprising, um, the Udumchi massacre, the anniversary of that is on July 5th. And so I know in San Francisco, we're gonna be doing a sort of a demonstration and a march. And I believe that those kinds of events are happening all over the country. So if you can connect with um, local Uyghur communities, then that is something certainly um, that people probably would you know, welcome you into, but I'm gonna share my screen one more time because I wanna show you a document that actually through the sisterhood of Salam Shalom that Lisa talked about at the very beginning of our evening, we have created a one page toolkit. And so I'm gonna share my screen with you. 
and show you this toolkit. And the toolkit, so let me just blow this up. The um, toolkit has links. And so this should be available on the Sisterhood website in the coming weeks. And this has a bunch of links to more information. If you'd like to learn more, there are links directly to the things I was just talking about, the um, both of the things in Congress and there are additional petitions here. Um, and then if those of you who are on social media are active in you know doing human rights advocacy through your social media accounts, there are a number of hashtags, um, other things that you can connect to through Instagram and other social media means. So those are some things, you know, there are a couple things you can do right now if you're interested in that only take a minute and then just thinking sort of in the long term, continue to raise awareness, continue to talk about this, continue to acknowledge the scale of the atrocities. And, you know, to the person who is asking the questions about the businesses, um, you know, supporting China, it is clear that China has very strong economic ties with many nations and many corporations. And so that's something that, you know, just as a consumer, if you try to, you know, maybe not purchase things that are made in China, that's just, that's an action you can also take on a personal level and just, you know, keep the pressure, keep continuing to talk about it um, so that China will not be able to continue to deny it. So thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, Tips and I, thank you. Lena, thank you for sharing those. Let me just ask you, this is what somebody posed this question about, is there any reason to believe that any of the efforts that are out there that are taking place, are they having an impact? Is there any sense that the pressure is working in any way or, or is this so far still kind of up against a brick wall? Definitely, uh, you know, I, I follow China's responses to a number of things that are happening and definitely um, the intensity of China's responses have increased. And so I think that, you know, China is definitely feeling the pressure. Um, I saw there was a question somewhere about the UN and I wanted to address, you know, um, the United Nations, uh, was a wonderful international organization that was formed after World War II in the aftermath of the Holocaust exactly to prevent those kinds of horrors from happening again. Yet last year, China was elected to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. Um, and so there are clear <laughs> um, bodies that are not taking, I think, as much of an active stance as they could against the situation. And so I think on a grassroots level, um, that pressure needs to continue. And then, um, you know, hopefully things will trickle up. But as I mentioned, there are a number of countries now, I think it's seven in total, who have declared genocide. And um, it's spreading. But, you know, I think it's really important to maintain the pressure and continue to talk about things. And, uh, you know, so China has responded, sanctions have been placed on Chinese officials. Um, and if, if we continue down that road, I think economic damage to China is, is a meaningful way to create an impact um, that I think could have repercussions that would uh, help the Uyghurs too. And I, I will say that we're gonna, I'm gonna send up a follow-up email and I'll include some of these resources that Lena is talking about and a link to some of the pages like the one that has been put together and is in the process of being put together by the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. So we'll get those out to everybody. Uh, we need to wrap it up, but Arzu, if I can ask one last question to uh, Tersenai, and that is, what would she like us to do? What, what would she like us to take away from this program and from hearing her story? Bunca <gülüyor> 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 <gülüy
First of all, I want to thank everyone here uh, for helping us to give voice to our people. The second thing that I really, I really want to ask from everyone that uh, even though such a big um, atrocity is happening in China in great scale, but still there are many people who are pretending not to see it and they are trying to keep, um, uh, keep their good relationship with, and ties with China. For example, like Olympic Games, it's unimaginable that it's going to happen in China in such a country. And um, this, is, uh, this is not acceptable. I want everyone to give voice and, and to make pressure, um, not only, um, not only for stopping this genocide, and also we need to um, keep advocating uh, so that people will not uh, support uh, China's um, China's atrocity. And when you know when we speak, uh, usually China uses our relatives to pressure us. Maybe she also wanted to say you don't have this pressure. <laughs> she says China is using their relatives to pressure um, so that um, so that they will um, to uh, using their relatives to bring pressures uh, to um, not to let them speak and not let me to speak uh, for them. But I will continue to speak on the behalf of my people. And I will ask um, everyone, um, especially uh, um, I, want to, uh, I want to ask you to take meaningful action. I want to see a meaningful actions will be uh, taking place against China's atrocity. Thank you, everyone. Finished. Thank you very much. Um, we do need to wrap our program up. I want to thank Lena Lenberg for her guidance and uh, oversight and, and knowledge. I, of course, want to thank Tersenai Ziawuddin for sharing her firsthand experience and Arzu for your help in translating. Thank you. You're welcome. I want to thank our partners, the Campaign for Uyghurs and the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom for helping to organize this program. And I thank all of you for joining us this evening. And I hope that we can make a change and we can help change what's taking place. And it, it doesn't have to be all one giant step. It takes lots of small steps. And don't let us get intimidated by the scale of the challenge ahead of us to make us stop at least trying that little small step. So if we all try, I hope we can make a difference. So thank you everybody. <laughs> And I look forward to seeing you at other programs. And um, thank you for being here. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.